The Secularization of Science is an essay by the philosopher Hermann Doyevierd. We're going to look at it in two parts. So here's part one, religion and scholarship. Now, the secularization of science is a rallying cry for Christian thinkers to think Christianly about science. Doyevierd is claiming that no one can think about scientific issues in a religiously neutral way. This talk started life, uh, it was a conference talk given in Montpellier in France in 1953 to Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, and they were Christians who saw themselves also as following in the footsteps of John Calvin's Reformation in the church and in the state and the separation of those two. And they were also aware of the uh, Dutch, Dutch thinker Abraham Kuyper and his development of ideas about Christian worldview and how that could impact church, state, journalism, higher education, and all these areas of society that Kuyper was involved in at the turn of the 20th century. So here in this talk, Herman Doyevierd, uh, who's now almost 60 years old, is calling younger thinkers to take very seriously God's call to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of everything, including scientific work. So one thing that David thinks we may need to repent of is our part in the secularization of science itself. Now we need to understand um, what's going on here. So here in this slide, we have the, the different sections of the essay, um, eight sections numbered here. And in this part, we're particularly going to look at these first five sections. So David is saying science can't be neutral and First of all, we need to realize that by science, he doesn't just mean natural sciences like physics, chemistry, and biology. He has a much broader view of science. He really means scholarship, all sorts of academic work, which can go through to uh, sociology, economics, um, politics, legal science, his own specialism, and, and many others, mathematics as well, for that matter. The second thing we need to realize is that Joyovid is, by secularization, He's not talking about um, separa separation of church from state or separation of church from science, or he's not even talking about separation of religion from science. In fact, it's something very different. His idea is that there are these different spheres of life and society represented in this blue diagram by the different uh, segments. Uh, and these are all parts of our everyday life we may all be involved in these different spheres of life or maybe at least in some of them. But Doyevierd, religion is not one of those segments, it's not one of those spheres of culture, it's actually the thing that binds them all together. So Doyevierd says religion is the central sphere of human existence which gives life as a whole its orientation. And for him secularization is actually a kind of religious movement. And he even talks in kind of New Testament terms about the spirit of secularization. So for him, religion is what holds together all of our life. And so clearly he's not talking necessarily about conventional ideas of religion here. He actually has a much bigger picture. It's that central sphere which gives meaning to life. So we're going to look in a bit more detail at what he means by that. But he's saying here that being in science, whether as a teacher, researcher, a journalist, or in any sense at all, is a very serious calling. And it's not a safe calling that we can keep separate from our religion. And so we as Christians uh, need to be prayerfully immersed in the scriptures, thinking and working in the power of the Holy Spirit, looking for what Doivet calls inner reformation of the sciences. He thinks that, first of all, we need to look very carefully at our own worldview. And after that, we can look at other worldviews around us and where this thing called secularism has come from. So here's what Doivierd says a biblical worldview should look like. He says there are three key moments in this biblical worldview, creation, fall and redemption. This colourful disc in this diagram represents all of reality that we experience, everything within this created order, all of the everyday uh, situations and places, and also all of the scientific ideas that we learn and discover. And all of this sphere of reality is on a journey. It has its origin, we are told by God in the Bible, in God himself, and Jesus Christ is there as the author of creation. It then goes through this moment called the fall, 
uh, where sin and evil comes in and corrupts the whole cosmos, the whole created order, somehow is caught up in human rebellion. But it's on a journey through redemption. And so because of Jesus Christ coming um, as God's representative and God himself on earth uh, to take sin into himself uh, and be crucified and resurrected, with him as the representative of humanity, all of creation can be redeemed. And that is the journey that we are caught up in ourselves. And that's what we're supposed to participate in. Now, in the middle of this disc, we have a symbol of a heart because Doivir points out very correctly, I think, that in the Bible, the word heart in both Old and New Testaments is used to refer to that central uh, point of our commitments, that central part of our experience and consciousness, uh, which is where we decide what to do. And it's in the heart that the Bible says we either follow God or we turn aside to idolatry. Now, in this diagram, we also need to be aware there's only one axis of good and evil, good and bad. The whole creation starts out good and it all becomes corrupted with evil at the fall. And it's all in the process of being rescued by God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we understand how this relates to science? So first of all, this Christian worldview of creation, fall and redemption ought to be taking that central place in our lives as Christians, holding together all of the other activities that we may be involved in, including scientific work. The Doivid says that there needs to be, or there is inevitably, an inner kind of contact point between religion and science, just as it connects with everything else in culture. So he talks about uh, an inner point of contact uh, where whichever religion we follow is going to connect with science. Now he leaves that as something of a mystery, um, but he's saying that we need to be able to explore and understand that internal structure of science and what he calls theoretical thought, how it works, how it's built up, and how it comes out of human beings, their minds and their bodies and everything else that we are when we think. And then we need to try and set up a really truly faithful picture of the world, uh, which is going to be faithful to God's revelation as an alternative to the secularized picture. Now in this essay, he's not showing in great detail how that works. He's not giving even a, a detailed philosophical argument. Instead, he's giving us a sweeping philosophical and historical overview that makes it plausible that science is connected to religion right at its root, right in that foundation. So next, Doivird goes on to his historical tour, uh, and he starts with ancient Greece. And this may be true of ancient cultures more generally as well. He says that we have, in ancient Greek um, thought, there is culture, and probably in that time it's less differentiated than we know now. We don't have, the, the Greeks in those times didn't have so many separate institutions of culture um, of, of businesses and schools and governments and so on. Um, there was generally families and tribes, um, and that was much more of a, a simple society. But nevertheless, it has this religious motive in the center. And in the most ancient Greek religion, Doivird says we can discern the principle of matter. Now this means matter in the sense of an eternal stream of life. It's the uh, stream of existence, which is somewhat chaotic, but carries everything along with it. Things are born, they decay, they disappear again, uh, and on goes the cycle of life. Now, Doivid says that is a religious starting point, um, which we can find in ancient Greek culture. And it's important that it's religious. He talks about the religion of Dionysius. Now, fast forward just a little bit in Greek culture, and we come to a slightly more familiar idea of the religion of the Olympian gods, the gods of Mount Olympus, of Zeus and Poseidon and Athena and so on. And here, uh, Doivid discerns that there's an alternative religious principle which he calls form, which is kind of evoked as the opposite of matter. That is, form tries to put shape into matter. Uh, and the, the form matter idea comes out in Aristotle, a Greek philosopher himself, who recognizes this tension between the eternal uh, somewhat chaotic stream of life and the attempt to place immortal structure and form into it. And the gods of Mount Olympus, the immortals, um, represent this yearning for stability and for form. 
But Doibid says, because this is not the true account of reality, this is not in fact what reality is made of or where it comes from, these two religious principles are always in tension. And he has this idea of a religious dialectic or dualism, where sometimes one gets the upper hand, sometimes the other. Now, fast forward a lot further, and with the early church, there was an attempt to graft Christian thinking onto ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, ancient Greek philosophy was impressive, it had done great things, and in some ways it was on, only natural that the early church fathers and thinkers should try to find a way of accommodating Christian theology into it. And so Doivid says, this form and matter tension now itself becomes subordinated to the principle of grace. And so we have the, a new dualism of grace and nature. And Doivid says this is not the true biblical principle either, because that is really creation, fall, and redemption. But instead, we have this grace versus nature dualism, which he says is very successfully held together as a kind of unity, a synthesis um, in medieval Christian philosophy, and supremely that of Thomas Aquinas. But nevertheless, it remains a dualism. And on the whole, in the Christian thinking, Christendom, Grace seems to have the upper hand, of course. Grace is God's goodness, and grace seems to be the realm of special revelation um, of uh, the church and ultimately of going to heaven when you die, whereas nature is everything else that's left and is the same for everyone. Now, when Christian thinkers try to do justice to this, um, we have the uh, important concepts like saving grace, which is God's grace for Christians, and common grace, which is grace for everyone, which really corresponds to nature, to everything else, to the things that enable us to do philosophy, maths and physics and so on. But actually, uh, that because it's an unstable dualism, because it's not really how God has revealed himself to us as nature plus something else, it's not just a, a neutral creation with some grace added on top, then sooner or later we start to get the other pole of nature gets emphasized instead. And grace becomes in some ways subordinated in culture at large. And so church with all its talk about uh, going to heaven, uh, of being righteous and sinless and of uh, perhaps being uh, able to get, um, go to heaven when you die and so on, and having priests who administer the grace, this starts to be lost and cut off from what everybody else is interested in, which is business, politics, arts, and indeed, university and science. So now we have nature dominating and grace being lost from view. So what kind of religion is left uh, for those who are not um, trying to keep hold on church and Christian thinking? Are they left with a kind of neutrality? Well, no, Doivid says, it can't possibly be a kind of um, mere neutrality in the middle. It's still a religious principle. And next time we're going to look at what he says happens to the idea of nature once grace is completely cut off and flies away. At this stage, Doivid says, the secularization of science had reached its culmination. Here we are in the late medieval period, that 16th century or so. So what we have here is a story of religions swallowing each other up. Doivid says, religions don't go away, they just get eaten up by other religions because humankind cannot live without some notion of ultimate meaning, purpose and reality. And so here we need to realize that in a proper biblical view, uh, Jesus Christ uh, demands our total allegiance to his way and to the revelation of God that we have through him and through the Bible. And that will enable us to hold together our life and our society together and to find out how to do science properly. So that's a brief overview of Doivid's story of history, trying to show the uh, competition between these religious motives, as he calls them, religious ground motives, he calls them. So just a few points in concluding, what is he saying then about science as a secularized thing? So first of all, let's note, he's not saying that science is the cause of secularization. Far from it, secularization has its own dynamic and it results in the idea that science could be neutral. So secularized science is that movement, part of that movement that claims to be religiously independent and that the ways we do science and think about it have nothing to do with our personal religious commitments. 
Joyvid has tried to show that that's very unlikely, that's highly implausible when we see where our civilization has come from. So, he says, as Christians, we need an inner critique of science and scholarship more broadly. And elsewhere in his writings, Joyvid has indeed offered one. For now, let's think about where we are. We're not talking about throwing out um, everything that's been discovered and setting up an alternative Christian science, Christian maths and everything else. But we are presumably talking about being critical in our teaching, our research, our explanations, our communication and so on. The task of this inner reformation of the sciences is surely going to be complex and demanding. Joy Veard himself, who's a legal scientist, legal scholar, he made a start with his Encyclopedia of the Science of Law. And some quite exciting work has been done for the natural sciences and maths as well. And I have uh, a recommended uh, book or two to suggest in the next slide. So there's obviously a lot more that we need to ask here. This leaves a lot of questions open. Uh, and uh, there's going to be an opportunity to have discussion through the webinar when I've finished. The next session is going to be looking at how Doivir sees the religious motive of modern humanism taking us up to the present time and what it does to science. But for now, here's some suggested reading for taking some of these ideas further, uh, including the second item, Doivir's own book, Roots of Western Culture, which unpacks a lot of these ideas further. Uh, and at the bottom there, what an example of applying Doivir's philosophical framework to physics. Thanks very much. Uh, now we're going to end um, and do follow on for the next session um, where we look at the rest of the essay. Thanks very much.